Imagine a mathematical enigma, an endless sequence of rational numbers multiplied together that astonishingly yields an irrational number. This isn't just any result. It's a profound connection to one of mathematics' most fundamental constants, pi. This is known as Wallace's product. Look closely at the terms. We see a remarkable pattern. Consider the numbers in the numerators, 2, 2, 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, 8, and so on. Now look at the denominators, 1, 3, 3, 5, 5, 7, 7, 9, and so on. One way to view this is as a product where the terms involve all natural numbers, and another set of terms involves natural numbers excluding one. When these infinite rational terms are multiplied together, the result is exactly pi over 2. This beautiful discovery by John Wallace in 1655 captivated mathematicians of his time. Its elegance stood in stark contrast to earlier, more complex expressions for pi, solidifying Wallace's legacy as a pivotal figure in mathematics before the age of Newton. But how does a product of such simple rational numbers connect to the seemingly transcendental number pi? Can something as fundamental as natural numbers truly generate a circle? This profound question leads us to a fascinating geometric and analytic approach, not through infinitely large circles, but through the continuous motion of rotation. Imagine a complex plane where the horizontal axis represents real numbers and the vertical axis represents imaginary numbers. We can think of a point rotating in this abstract plane, naturally connecting to complex numbers. Does this abstract idea remind you of anything? For many, it will immediately bring to mind one of the most beautiful formulas in mathematics, Euler's formula. Indeed, it's Euler's formula. This equation beautifully links exponential functions, imaginary numbers, and trigonometric functions. From this, we can define our standard for rotation. When our abstract rotating point would touch the real axis in this plane, it means the imaginary part is zero, so sine of x equals zero. In terms of radian measure, these are the points where x is an integer multiple of pi. 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, and so on. And when it touches the imaginary axis, the real part is 0, meaning cosine of x equals 0. These correspond to points where x is an odd multiple of pi over 2, plus or minus pi over 2, plus or minus 3 pi over 2, plus or minus 5 pi over 2, and so on. This is the standard we need. Now let's consider a continuous function f of x that has zeros at specific points. 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, and so on. This set of zeros precisely defines the behavior of the sine function. This function is the sine function, sine of x. Just like a polynomial can be factored by its roots, an infinite series can also be expressed as an infinite product based on its zeros. For the sine function, which has zeros at x equals n pi for any integer n, its infinite product representation is given by sine of x equals a times x, multiplied by products of 1 minus x squared over n squared pi squared. Here, a is an unknown constant, and the term x outside the product accounts for the zero at x equals zero. Our next step is to determine the value of this unknown coefficient, a. Let's rearrange the equation by dividing both sides by x. Now we will take the limit as x approaches zero on both sides of the equation. This is a powerful technique in calculus. On the left side, we have a fundamental limit from calculus, limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x. This limit is known to be equal to one. On the right side, as x approaches zero, each term one minus x squared over n squared pi squared approaches one minus zero squared over n squared pi squared, which simplifies to one. Therefore, the infinite product itself approaches one. This tells us that our unknown constant a is simply one. Now we have the complete infinite product representation of the sine function which can also be written as sine of x equals x times the product of 1 minus x squared over pi squared, 1 minus x squared over 4 pi squared, 1 minus x squared over 9 pi squared, and so on. Now, for the grand reveal, to derive Wallace's product, we're going to substitute a very specific value for x into this equation. x equals pi over 2. Let's evaluate the left side. Um, sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1. Now let's simplify each term within the product on the right side. For the first term, 3 fourths equals, equals 2 minus 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 times 3 over 2 times 2, or 1 half times 3 halves. Substituting these back, we get 1 equals pi over 2 times 3 fourths times 15 sixteenths times 35 thirty sixths. 
and so on. Now let's divide both sides by pi over 2 or equivalently multiply by 2 over pi. Finally, let's express each of these fractions as a product of two terms using the difference of squares, n squared minus 1 equals n minus 1 times n plus 1. For example, 3 fourths equals 2 minus 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 times 3 over 2 times 2, or 1 half times 3 halves. Uh, applying this to our equation, we get 2 over pi equals 1 half times 3 halves times 3 fourths times 5 fourths, times 5 sixths, times 7 sixths, and so on. And with a simple reordering of terms, we arrive at Wallace's product, but in its inverse form. And then by taking the reciprocal of both sides, we have the majestic Wallace's product, precisely as we introduced it. This is a truly elegant result, showing how the product of infinitely many rational numbers beautifully converges to pi over 2. If you found this exploration of Wallace's product and its fascinating connections helpful, please consider giving this video a like. Share it with anyone who loves mathematics or is curious about the hidden harmony in numbers. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos that unravel the elegance of calculus and beyond. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Imagine